Good morning. morning. Traveling is a very interesting experience, as you know, and as you further know, it is always a source of joy and instruction to me. And this morning I'm thinking particularly of the many fears that I have experienced on the the trips in the last 20 years in traveling the world, or going back even before that. I'm trying, yes, right now, I'm remembering how fears of Hitler and his conquest of the world in which we were all to be his slaves, except those who had some Jewish blood, and we were to be dead slaves. But along with the fear of uh, Hitler, we also had a man in uh, the eastern part of this country, Mr. C.I.O. Lewis, and uh, he was probably second only to Mr. Hitler in the fears that he uh, set out into orbit. And then, of course, was always the great boast of the power that we had, our country, our government, our armed forces. Of course, Mr. Hitler is gone. The fears have been buried with him. Mr. Lewis is gone, and the fears have been buried with him. The great powers of our armed forces that were going to do so much to free the world, they're gone too. And the fears that went with them, for they haven't uh, settled the fears, they haven't destroyed the enemies. Matter of fact, they just created a few more empty countries to build up and finance again, and arm again. All of these fears come and go, and they are all connected with the one word power. Think of any fear that has ever touched your individual life, as well as any fear that has touched your national life, and see to what extent it is connected with that one word power. Power, oh, the terrible powers of uh, the dictators, and oh, the terrible powers of the bombs, and the terrible powers of this, that, and the other thing. Lately, it's the power of the government, or the power of Wall Street. It's always a power. And about, well, it's before the war began, when Hitler was at his height, I was walking along the street one day and uh, felt that my pen was just about to erupt and ran into a nearby building, sat down at a table and wrote, and from the pen came this, supposing, supposing right now that we were to withdraw power from the powers that we fear, or suppose that we were to withdraw fear from the powers that we fear. Suppose just for a single moment we could give up the word power in thinking of our relationships, personal, national, international, if we could give up the word power Oh, to make this concrete, let us bring it right down to ourselves and uh, see what would happen if you and I should determine on a relationship in which we would never use the word power. We would never think of any power that we had over each other or the power to get our way or any power of enforcing our will. How then uh, 
would we find ourselves in relationship to each other? I want harmony with you. You want harmony with me, but I no longer have access to any power. In other words, I can't enforce my will, my desire, my hope. Where are we now in relationship to each other as we sit here? Each desiring harmony, peace, joy, friendship. And yet, we no longer can promise each other or threaten each other. We even give up the right to sue each other, mentally I mean. And we place ourselves in what would seem to be an absolutely defenseless position. I am sitting here without a single weapon of offense or defense, and yet praying for peace, harmony, wholeness, and completeness. But in this case, you are doing the same. We are withdrawing the word power from our experience. And all that the word power implies. Well, what happened was this, that eventually as this writing unfolded, it became clear to me that actually these powers that we feared weren't powers. These powers that we were fearing as if they were going to do some terrible thing to us, or in some cases the power that was going to do such wonderful things for us, these powers weren't powers at all. They were only operating as power in the consciousness that could accept them as power. And for this reason, not only had a temporary sense of power, but the ability to cause all of these fears. Now see what's happened in the years that have gone by. See what has happened to this great power of Hitler. See what has happened to this great power of all of these armaments that laid Europe bear. The evil powers that we feared of the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Stalins, these fears uh, have never come to fruition. The things we feared have not come upon us. And the great good that we expected from the mighty power of our armaments hasn't come about either. They haven't brought us peace. They haven't settled one single question of international affairs. They haven't destroyed a single enemy. Not a one. An individual dies here or there and uh, six more rise up to take his place. We've had six times more dictatorships since Hitler than we had at Hitler's time. And uh, each one of them spouting fear into uh, the orbit of human consciousness and we foolishly repeating the history of the ages fearing that which never has had power now <clears throat> this is only you might say a line of philosophic thought that uh, might lead us into becoming pacifists or conscientious objectors. That isn't true. This is a line of thought that begins with uh, philosophic speculation, but ends up with spiritual realization. Because the ultimate of this unfoldment was that power does not exist in that which has form or effect. But power is in the consciousness that produces the form and the effect. Now, 
The result of this, call it spiritual unfoldment, if you will, the result of this is to lift the individual above the realm of fear. You have to watch it in small ways in the beginning. You can't rise to the point immediately of saying, I don't fear an atomic bomb. You have to start in uh, smaller ways and uh, perhaps begin with weather or climate or food or germs and begin to withdraw your power from these. Begin to understand that in and of themselves they cannot have power because all power is in the consciousness that produces forms. All power is in the consciousness that produces forms, not in the forms. This is important to you because if you can begin with, well, let's have meditation. If you can begin your meditation with the central theme in your mind of beholding effects, looking out at the weather, at the climate, at the food, at the germs, and uh, perceiving that they in and of themselves cannot have power except the power that we imbue them with because the power is within our consciousness. This has been uh, said in these words. Nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. In other words, the evil is not in the thing. The evil is not in the thought. The evil is not in uh, the effect. Whatever evil there is, uh, is in our sense of what we are beholding or the power with which we imbue an individual or a condition, a circumstance. Now, most of you, of course, I realize, have already demonstrated this in uh, some degree or other, because most of you have had the experience of your studies and practice, and you already know that many of the so-called powers of the world have been rendered powerless by this spiritual practice, by this spiritual awareness. You have uh, experienced in your life, in your business, in your health, some in a small degree and some in very great degree, the operation of this principle. But until you consciously take it into yourself, into your inner sanctuary, into your consciousness, and abide with it, you cannot make it practical in your own daily experience. Ah, yes, you receive the benefit of those who have attained the consciousness of non-power, but this is of only temporary help to you eventually you yourself must take this subject into meditation. You yourself must let your thought wander across the whole span of your human life and check what things you have feared or what persons you have feared or what conditions you have feared and begin now to withdraw that fear by withdrawing the power. Let's see if we can do this in a practical way uh, for a start right now.
God is infinite consciousness. This you know. God is the consciousness of the entire universe. It is out of that consciousness which is God that the whole world has uh, become manifested. It is for this reason that God and his spiritual universe is one. Think on this, this is important, God and his spiritual universe is one. God looked upon his universe and saw that it was good, saw that it was all good. Now, God as consciousness, the substance of the entire spiritual creation, could only pr create or manifest a world in the image and likeness of himself, of God. Therefore, this spiritual universe is imbued with the qualities of God and of no other qualities. Only God entered his own universe. Only God, the qualities, the activities of God entered his own universe. And therefore, all that exists is in and of God. Now you can understand from this that there is no evil power in the spiritual creation. There is no evil power in God. In him is no darkness. Nothing could ever enter the consciousness of God that defileth or maketh a lie. God is too pure to behold iniquity. The consciousness of God is absolute purity, life eternal, immortality itself. God has no pleasure in your dying, therefore God has not created death or anything that could cause death. God is absolute spirit, life eternal, and God functioning as the consciousness of Christ Jesus says, I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have life more abundantly. Not, I have come that ye might have death or not that I have come that ye might have life until you are threescore years and ten. But I am come that ye might have life, eternal life. In fact, the voice of God, again, speaking as the consciousness of Christ Jesus says, I am life eternal. There is no room in life eternal or life more abundant for death or that which would cause death. Therefore, mark this, nothing was ever created that was empowered to cause sin, disease, or death. Nothing was ever created by God that was empowered to cause the distress of man. God has no pleasure in your dying. Again, God speaking as the still small voice through the consciousness of the master says I am thy bread I meet thy water I am the resurrection I am the life always God in voicing is voicing the eternality, the immortality of man. Now, just remember that as you go back into the original creation, the spiritual creation as revealed in the first chapter of Genesis, you find not one single sign of discord not one sign of anything that is empowered to destroy God's universe. 
if there were, you would be saying that God the creator is also God the destroyer. That God at the time of creation also made something to destroy his own creation. That would make of God a monster. <clears throat> the only way in which we accept the oriental teaching of God as both creator and destroyer is in the sense that God is the creator of the universe and must automatically be the destroyer of anything that would be contrary to the spiritual creation. And that would not mean the destroyer of anything real. The principle of mathematics does not destroy anything when it reveals two times two as four or when it reveals the impossibility of two times two being five. You might say that through mathematics we've destroyed two times two as five, but we haven't because there never was a two times two as five there existed only an illusory belief in the mind of man. Never in the history of the world has there been an exception found to a law of God, whether it is two times two is four or H2O is water, whatever it may be that emanates from the mind of God exists without exception anywhere at any time. Every law is absolute, and so is the law of life absolute. Now just think where this leads you. Since God is the self-created, self-maintaining, self-sustaining principle of this universe, the responsibility for our immortality and eternality is uh, with God. Not with man, and not with bombs, and not with germs, and not with Wall Street upsets. Oh no. The fate of man is not in effect, but in consciousness. The consciousness which is God. The infinite, the divine, the pure. Actually, this consciousness is the consciousness of man. and in its unconditioned state leaves man as it did Melchizedek, as it did the Christ, spiritual, untouched by mortal conditions, material circumstances, or human beliefs. Then the evils that befall us are not in God or in man, but rather in the conditioning that we receive through the ignorance that has been uh, foisted upon us from time immemorial. In other words, every time that we give power to a person a thing, a condition, our consciousness is conditioned. And to that extent, we become victims of it. You know, you'd be surprised how little it would take to make us fear each other. You'd be surprised how easy it would be for some individual to come along and either for some specific purpose or just for fun to show us how easy it would be in a short time to make us distrust each other and then in the end fear each other. It has been done over and over and over again. We witnessed it in this uh, country and before both of the major wars when by a planned activity of government within a period of six months we were so made to fear outside powers that we shouted let us go to war just before that we had been electing presidents because he kept us out of war oh it's a very simple thing to condition 
the mind of people who are not alert to the fact that they should not be permitting themselves to accept the opinions, thoughts, and beliefs of uh, others, but to retire within themselves for divine guidance. <laughs> I came home to my desk yesterday and found on it some stock advice that had been sent to me about a month ago telling me now was the time to buy heavily in the stock market. Now was the time the boom was coming. But you see, if you listen to all of the propaganda and the theories and the opinions of others, very soon you'll find yourself not only fighting with yourself, but fighting with your neighbors, and you'll end up fighting with your parents if they so desire. The question is this. To whom do you pay allegiance? To whom do you surrender your mind, your thoughts? Out in the world it is very difficult for people because in the, the West they have not been taught the power of meditation, of turning within to that presence that is within each one of us for its guidance, instruction, and wisdom. And so we are accustomed to taking our opinions from the newspapers or the magazines or our favorite political party instead of learning to be taught of God. It is said that in the end we'll all be taught of God, and that is true, we will. But that end need not be a hundred years from now or a hundred lifetimes from now. It can be today. As most of you already know, by practice, the kingdom of God is within you. Going back to our original thought, if this is true, the kingdom of power is within you, because God is power. And not only this, God is all the power there really is, since we use, in referring to God, we use the word omnipotence. Now you cannot use the word omnipotence lightly, at least you shouldn't. If the word omnipotence means all power, if you can accept God as all power, and if you can accept God, the presence of God, the power of God, the kingdom of God, as being within you, then you can understand why Scripture says, the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Why? because I and my Father are here. I and my Father. I am inseparable from my Father. I am indivisible from my Father. For the kingdom of my Father is within me. The kingdom then of omnipotence is within me, and only as I can meditate or cogitate upon this can I look out here and then say, I shall not fear what mortal man can do to me. I shall not fear what mortal conditions can do to me. I shall not fear what mortality can do to me. I shall not fear what germs or bombs can do to me, because the kingdom of God, omnipotence, is within me. All power is within me. Now, here is where the student on the mystical path has to take his departure from <clears throat> the ordinary person of religious inclination. Ordinarily, 
God is accepted not as omnipotence, but merely as a great power. And prayers are intended to invoke that great power of God over this enemy, whatever it may be. It could be sin, it could be disease, it could be death, it could be wars, it could be anything. But the idea usually entertained of prayer is invoking the power of God to destroy this enemy, this sin, or this disease, or this false appetite, or the dictators. Now, of course, none of this has ever been true. And it's for this reason that we've gone through 50 centuries of praying without ever yet achieving peace on earth, or health on earth, or safety on earth, or security on earth, or prosperity on earth. Regardless of all our prayers for these, they're still absent from the world. And the reason is, of course, that God is not a great power over these other powers. The truth is, God is omnipotence, and these other powers aren't powers, except in proportion as you are conditioned to accepting them so. Now just remember, lots of hold-ups have been committed with toy pistols. There was no power in the toy pistols, but there was a fear. Don't forget how many people have died through the ancient bad kahunas. There was no power of evil or of death in those bad kahunas. The power was in the fear that was engendered in the victim. Think of how many people have died or have been made miserable through witchcraft. There never was any power in witches or witchcraft. The power was in the fear that was engendered in the individual. Recently, uh, another experiment was conducted in a medical university of uh, taking a group of students, medical students, and uh, feeding one half of them with uh, cold germs, germs meant to produce colds, and the other half just uh, capsules of water. Of course, the students believed that they were all cold germs. But about the same percentage in each group caught cold. And then when they reversed it, the same thing happened again. The power wasn't in the capsules. The power was in the fear that was engendered in the minds of the individual. It happens all of the time. I read an article recently ridiculing the idea of uh, catching cold by sitting in a draft. Well, of course, a few years ago, that, that was as uh, uh, much of a law as uh, the law of two times two is four. Now, all of a sudden, it's ridiculed. Why? Well, it's been discovered that air has the same quality, whether it comes through a window or a door or goes in and out of a window or a door. It's still air. It isn't too long ago that we were cautioned not to get our feet wet because we'd catch cold. We didn't get our we didn't catch cold getting our feet wet in a bathtub, only if we were out on the street. It sounds foolish now, looking back on it, but think how many of us were actually victims of those beliefs in those days. It never was the air or the water that gave us a cold. It was the fear that was engendered in us. And so it is that right now, as we travel the world, we are witnessing the fears that are hammering at the consciousness of men. And in these last ten years, it's been almost laughable to witness the waves of fear that have gone across not only this country, but many other countries, 
with so many different things that threatened that, and all of them died out. It's only a few months ago, if you remember, that the papers were filled with bomb-proof shelters and how fast to get to them and so forth and so on, and now it's almost disappeared from the press. Let us then get this clear. In your consciousness, which is really the consciousness of God, God breathed his own life into you, the breath of his own life, which is God's own consciousness has been bestowed upon you. In your unconditioned state, you are immortal and eternal, and nothing external to you, and nobody external to you, has power, jurisdiction, or control over you. You are an individual. You are an individual, one with God. The place whereon thou standest is holy ground. I and the Father are one. And the Father says, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. All of the omnipotence, all of the divine grace, all of the divine love, all of the divine power is yours. Therefore, nothing external to you can act upon you. Now, if you permit yourself to be conditioned by accepting the universal beliefs, the universal fears, then, of course, they act upon you the same as they act upon the rest of the human race. And you make yourself victims of them. You do not fear ghosts. There are some people who do. In other words, there is no power in ghosts. The power is in the fear that's engendered within you. There are today more than a million people on the face of the earth virtually untouched by germs, that is, harmful germs, practically immune to germ diseases. Why? There are just as many germs in their system as in anybody else's. But they have accepted the word omnipotence, they have agreed that all the power of God is given unto me, not unto germs, not unto weather, not unto climate. All the power of God has been given unto me. God has empowered us with his power. God has given us dominion over all that exists on the earth, under the earth, above the earth. We have surrendered this dominion by permitting ourselves to be conditioned by the world's ignorance and the world's fears. Think for a moment now in your meditation. I and my Father are one here and now. I and my Father are one. And in this oneness, I find not only spiritual power, I find my food, wine, water, inspiration, even resurrection. Now, often, often, we hear it said, I do not believe in resurrection. Do you believe in resurrection? I do not believe in resurrection. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. Scripture reveals from beginning to end that there is a power that restores to us the lost years of the locust. There is a power of resurrection, a power of restoration, regeneration, and Above all things, the Master came to reveal that this power is within you. He restored uh, to full and complete dignity the woman taken in adultery. He restored to heaven uh, the thief on the cross. This is all resurrection, restoration, regeneration.
Perhaps he made it a little difficult for us. No, he didn't make it difficult. The, the very law itself is difficult, and he merely revealed the difficulty of it because the power of resurrection lies in love. And that, of course, is difficult. Everybody wants to be loved, and so few want to love. And it's only in loving that resurrection can come. It is not in being loved. Oh no, we could be loved by millions and still die miserably. The power of resurrection is not in the love that is given to us. The power of resurrection is in the love that flows through us, out from us. In other words, the imprisoned splendor must be permitted to escape. And that imprisoned splendor is your life eternal, but life is love. There is no life separate and apart from love. You'll understand this more clearly. Again, it comes to your attention a great deal as you travel. You meet so many people who find life to be futile, who find that life isn't really worthwhile. It isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And uh, if you get to know them real well, you'll see why. The power of love has left them. Not the power of being loved. Oh, no. They're spending most of their life seeking love, seeking companionship, seeking understanding. Of course, they never find it. Because it isn't to be found. It is to be expressed. So it is. If you want life, and I mean life harmonious, not just an, uh, an existence from morning to night and night to morning. I mean real life, a life abundant in every way, physically, mentally, morally, financially. If you want life abundant, you don't go around looking for life, you live. You live. Uh, the man who attained a hundred years and was asked how he attained it wasn't spoofing when he said, I just kept on living. Of course that was the answer. But do you know something? You can't, you can't just keep on living unless you have something to live for. You can't. The moment a reason for living disappears, life disappears. And the only reason there ever is for living is love. It's funny. It sounds strange. It's true. There is no other reason for staying on earth than the opportunity to love. And anybody who has experienced this knows that there is no other joy like loving. No other joy like sharing, bestowing, understanding, giving. It is difficult. It is very difficult to make this clear to those who are living entirely in that realm of getting, wanting, desiring. It is simple. It is simple when you explain this to an individual who has within himself some touch of the Spirit of God. Unfortunately, there are those devoid of this Spirit of God, love of God. The Master referred to them as barren soil and rocky soil. Paul referred to them as the natural man, the creature, who is not under the law of God, neither indeed can be, because one thing is missing, one thing only, love. Love. The love they are seeking is the love they must be giving. Then you'll find, once that love is there, once that 
nature is there that wants to give, that wants to share, that wants to understand, that wants to meet this world halfway. The next step is really easy. The understanding that the real power of this world is in your consciousness, not somewhere external to it. Now this is our great lesson. God is the great infinite divine consciousness, the consciousness of this entire universe, of which this universe is formed. And God has given himself to us so that the life of God or consciousness of God is ours. The whole immortal life of God is ours. The whole divine consciousness of God is ours. I and my Father are one, and all that the Father hath is mine. All of this divine consciousness. Now, since I am already infinite, there is no need for me to seek good, or seek love, or seek companionship, or seek supply. I and my Father are already one. All that the Father hath is already mine. Now, in order for me to enjoy my spiritual heritage, I must find a way to let this imprisoned splendor, this gift of God, escape. And I can do it in two major ways. One is living constantly in the awareness that dominion has been given to me, God dominion, spiritual dominion, and therefore I need not fear anything or anyone external to myself. And then secondly, find ways, open out ways, for a greater expression of love to flow. The Master has given us so many different ways in which we may express this love. We can visit the prisoner in the prison. We can comfort the widow and the orphan. We can heal the sick. We can feed the hungry. We can clothe the naked. We can pray. We can pray for our enemies. We can forgive 70 times 7. All of this is loving. All of this is letting love flow out. In one way or another, we must ask ourselves the question that the Hebrew prophet asked of the widow. He said, what have you in your house? We say, what have I in my house? What have I? And the moment I say I, that brings me right back up against I and my father are one. I have all the father has. That's what I have in my house, all that the father has. All of the love, all of the life, all of the dominion, all of the grace, all of the supply to share. Even if I only share it with the few drops of oil that may be immediately available, or the little meal that's immediately available. Even if I begin with that old pair of shoes in the closet, no matter where I begin, if I begin to pour that which I have in the house, it increases. And the more it's used, the more it increases. It, it's like teaching. <clears throat> no student has ever learned as much from a teacher as the teacher learns from teaching the student. Because it is in the teaching that the flow flows. And the more that the teacher pours out, the more is pouring in to be poured out, whether it's teaching on the spiritual level or on the human level. The more experience or practice a teacher has in their particular line, the greater their own knowledge. Because the flow is from the infinite source that is within each one of us. Always remember, infinity is within us. 
the kingdom of God is within us. And we draw from this infinite source of withinness. The moment we acknowledge I and the Father are one, of ourselves we would be nothing. I of my own self, the Master says, can do nothing. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. But since I and the Father are one, I can do all things that the Father does. All things, because I and the Father are one and not two. So we have a principle, which is really two principles, or maybe it's two parts of one principle, to take into our meditations this coming week. As you seat yourself comfortably for your meditation, your eyes are closed, you're looking forward into this darkness, and you can see the infinite nature of this darkness. It's full and complete. And this darkness, now you understand to be your withinness. All of this darkness is within you. All of this space, if you like, is within you. All of this world that you're confronting is within you. And now here where I am, right here where I am, within me, within this very darkness, is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of allness, the kingdom of omnipotence, the kingdom of divine grace, all stored up here within me. If I was sitting alone in a rubber boat in the middle of the ocean, this realization should bring to me protection, safety, food, water, whatever I would need. If I were lost in the desert, this realization should lead me, even if I walk with my eyes closed, it should lead me right out of the desert into safety and security, or lead others into me. Since right here where I am, whether I'm mounting up to heaven or making my bed in hell makes no difference. Here where I am, God is. The fullness of God, the allness of God, the omnipotence of God, the grace of God. Now that I know this, I need have no fear for any circumstance or condition of the outer world because all dominion is within me. A thousand may fall at my left hand and ten thousand at my right of those who do not know this truth. It will not come nigh my dwelling place. Or, the Master says, if you abide in this word, if you let me abide in you, which we've been doing, haven't we? We've been realizing the very presence of this omnipotence within us. We have been letting God abide in us. You shall bear fruit richly. You shall bear fruit richly. You shall have the life and the life more abundant. If you abide in this truth, omnipotence is within you all power. No power exists external to you, not for good or for evil. All power exists within you. And now your function is to let it flow. Now just remember your example. The Master says, I am come that ye might have life and have it more abundantly. I have come to heal the sick. Forgive the sinner, feed the hungry, preach the gospel. This is your function. This is your function, to open out a way, to let the imprisoned splendor escape. He was the example. He was the way shower. And the way he showed was this. The kingdom of God is within you. Now you be the one to forgive the sinner to heal the sick, 
raise the dead, feed the hungry, clothe the poor. You be the one to pray for the enemy, not that they be punished, but that they be forgiven. Not that they be punished, but rather that their eyes be opened to the light of Christ. So you will find that practically, with one principle, you are living the Christ life. You are living the life, think of the Master now, who feared no disease, no death. He feared no pilot. Pilot, thou couldst have no power against me. Pilot is only another name for dictators. think that because of his realization of omnipotence, he feared nothing external to him, but at the same time that he was not fearing anything external, he was pouring forth his love, his healing consciousness, his sharing consciousness, his giving consciousness to this world, and not only to the saints, but remember, to the sinners. He was the example we must do likewise in order that we may be disciples, in order that we may be sons of God. We are not fulfilling ourselves as children of God unless, first of all, we are acknowledging omnipotence within ourselves and thereby fearing nothing external, and then secondly, letting the Christ love pour forth in infinite abundance. Thank you. Till next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. The infinite way is a religious teaching but it is a religious teaching without a religious organization. And for this reason, there are no rules, there are no laws, there are no memberships, there are no dues. Nothing exists of a uniting nature. Nothing on the human plane exists of a uniting nature that would bind together those who are students of the infinite way. No rules are laid down for the conduct of those who are students. No regulations no obligations. And the reason is, and perhaps this is also a reason why it would be centuries before the infinite way could ever be accepted on any large or general basis. The infinite way reveals that there is no strength in union, contrary to the belief that in union there is strength. The infinite way standpoint is that in human union there is no strength, there is weakness that the only strength is in union with God, in one's individual union with God. And it is for this reason that an infinite way student cannot have his religion in his wife's name or parent's name or child's name 
They must have the religion in their own name, in their own conscious oneness with God. Now, I do not know how a saying could gain worldwide recognition like in union there is strength when we have thousands of years of history to prove that in union there is only weakness because in every union the strength is only equal to the strength of the weakest link the moment the weakest link drops the entire union collapses in the religious history of the world there have been many wonderful religions each one has collapsed because of some weak link just try to remember what happened to the movement of Christ Jesus when Judas Iscariot deflected that one weak link changed the entire history of uh, the Christian movement under the master and think what followed when uh, Peter deserted now you have the entire collapse of the master's work through two weak links and you would have thought that if ever there was a union with strength it would be that of the master and the twelve disciples but those disciples were the very undoing of the entire work you can go through religious history and uh, find that repeated over and over again there was a most wonderful religion in India the Sikh religion founded by Guru Nanak based also on uh, the principles of non-organization and on no collective wealth as a matter of fact Guru Nanak taught that where there is wealth there has to be an army to protect it therefore he cautioned them never to have organized or united wealth because immediately they would have to violate his teaching his teaching was peace resist not evil do not take up the sword And of course the moment there is a united wealth of that kind there must be protective influences and in the third generation after Nanak one weak link destroyed the entire Sikh movement and changed it from the greatest Indian spiritual teaching to what it later became the warrior race of India the warrior race the great army the great power of the sword the very opposite of the founders teaching in the various governments of the world each one falls eventually no system of government has ever been found that lasts eternally each one collapses in its time and the history of each one reveals a weakness the weak link that ultimately destroys it you would only have to look at our present history to see a proof of that 
in the war the United States was linked with England and its empire or commonwealths, France, Belgium, the great powers of the world and uh, out of that came an armed victory, an armed victory which has turned to defeat because of one weak link. All of our trouble with Russia stems from the fact that one weak link allowed Russia to occupy Berlin, and this has been the source of trouble and irritation and the threat of war ever since. One weak link destroyed that great union, and instead of making it a great, great power, made it the weak power that we have become now, the power that trembles every time uh, Russia gets angry. On the other side, we were linked with Chiang Kai-shek, who was a mighty power in China for maintaining democratic government and a free world. And one weak link destroyed that and allowed communism to take over China. One weak link. Just one general in the United States Army with a weak mind influenced the course of action of the entire government and let all of China fall to the communists. And that one weak link gives us our threat now from the Pacific. It would be possible to sit here for a month and tell you the history of religion, government, industry, colossal powers that have been, be been built by union and show you how one by one they have collapsed, one by one they have fallen away, as always must be, because in every union the strength is in the strength of the weakest link. If we here were to unite, we wouldn't be destroyed by the strength in that union, but by some weak link that would develop in it and would carry the whole rest of it down. Instead of all the rest with their strength carrying the weak link, the one weak link would destroy all of the good strength, just as the one rotten apple in a barrel has such a harmful effect on the entire barrel. When you view the history of the world religiously, politically, commercially, from that standpoint, you at first have a sinking feeling in your heart as if, oh then, what is the use? <clears throat> and of course, that's a very good feeling. It's just as good as when any one of us humanly come to some place in our lives when uh, everything seems to be against us, either in our health or our supply or our family life. And we also say, oh my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is there no hope? It is in those moments of desperation or those moments of ultimate sorrow and despair that the answer comes, of course there is. God has no pleasure in your dying. Turn ye and live. Turn. Turn. That turn ye and live has deep meaning. It really means you have to turn in some way or other from what you have heretofore accepted. There has to be a definite turning of some kind in consciousness. So it is that this particular message of the infinite way reveals that in turning, you turn away from human union, human unitedness,
to spiritual union with your source. That you no longer look to man whose breath is in his nostril, even if there are vast numbers, or as one of the Psalms tells us, no longer put your faith in horses, armies, weapons, governments. Now you turn you turn from all reliance on man, modes and means, and find contact or union with the source of life which is within you. Fortunately, it doesn't involve a journey to India or Tibet or Rome or New York or Boston. It involves a journey within to the center of your own being. You are not to find your salvation in Mecca. You are to find that Mecca, the Holy Land, Jerusalem, is within you. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. It is for this reason that each student of the infinite way assumes a tremendous responsibility in order to be a student because he is virtually giving up reliance on all those things that men have heretofore relied on. There is even no reliance on one's church affiliation, for in the infinite way there is none. There is no reliance on being humanly united in a common cause, for there is no strength there. Each student stands on the strength of his own conscious union with God, the source within himself. No longer is there a faith on in some thought, some truth, some printed word, nor is there even salvation in obedience to a set of rules, not even the Ten Commandments. Here in the infinite way, faith is removed from faith in oneself, even faith in one's own goodness, even from faith in one's own deserving or worthiness. Faith is removed from any union of any human nature and is changed in this way. Turn ye now and live. Turn from any faith in combinations of people. Change, turn ye from faith in any book of rules, turn ye from any hope, from any known source, and realize first the kingdom of God is within me. Deep within my own consciousness is the temple of God. Ah, here we have it. Church, temple, synagogue. These are no longer words referring to external edifices. Church, synagogue.
synagogue, temple. These now refer to my consciousness, your consciousness, individual consciousness. Your consciousness is the temple of God. This can be better stated. Since you are actually consciousness, you are the temple of God. Ah, oh, now we are back to the Master's teaching. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Now just think. I, and you of course, are following me in this. I am the temple of God. God is in his holy temple. That is, God is within me. I am the temple of God. My consciousness is the temple of God. My mind is the temple of God. Know ye not that your body is the temple of God? God is the spirit that animates your body. God breathes the life of God into you as your life, so that your very life is the temple of God. Your life is the temple of God. Your soul is the temple of God. Your being, my being, is the temple of God, my body. God animates, spirit animates my body. I am the life. I am life eternal. I am the blood and the bones. The Spirit of God animates my being and body from head to foot. I am united to the entire source and creation, creative being of life, God, by my oneness with God, by my consciousness of my oneness with God. Now mark this, this is the most important words I have spoken today. While it is true that I and my Father are one, and that I am the temple of God, and even my body is the temple of God, remember that this is of no value, no benefit in my life except through my conscious knowing it. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Not the truth shall make you free. No. The truth is the truth, whether you know it or not. But if you do not know it, you may be one of the thousand who fall at the left, or ten thousand who fall at the right. But none of the evils of this world will come nigh the dwelling place of those who know the truth, consciously know the truth. Therefore, I turn now from my ignorance of God and man, being and body, I turn and know the truth. Consciously now I know that I and my Father are one. Here where I am, God is, for I am the temple of God. I am the church. I am the synagogue. I am the holy mountain. For the kingdom of God is within me. As the temple of God, God fills me. 
soul, being, and body. And I consciously know this truth. This is my union with God. My knowing the truth constitutes my conscious union with God. I am now consciously uniting myself with God. I have been one with God since before Abraham was, but it has done me no good until this moment when I consciously open myself to the inflow and experience of God. The kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. The kingdom of God is within me. You are following this because I'm speaking of you. The kingdom of God is within me. I am the temple of God. And my body is the temple of God. And my home is the temple of God. And my business is the temple of God. Because God has built me. God has built my body. No human being knows how to build a body. God builds the temple of this body. God has built my home. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Therefore, my home is built by God. My home is the temple of God, and God fills my home, every nook and cranny of it. Therefore, nothing can enter my home that defileth or maketh a lie. God has made my marriage. Therefore, my marriage is the temple of God. And that which God has united, no man can break asunder. My marriage is the temple of God. My family is the temple of God. My business is the temple of God. God built my business. And God is in the temple of my business. God is the bread, the meat, the wine, and the water of my business. My business is erected to God and dedicated to God, to good, to service, to quality, to the benefit of mankind. And it makes no difference whether my business is a grocery business, a church business, a plantation business, when its purpose is to serve mankind, it is the business of God, and God is in that business. Nothing shall enter my business that defileth or maketh a lie. If only we could know this is the truth about the steamship business. This is the truth about the banking business. This is the truth about all business that is erected and dedicated to the service to the benefit of mankind, because in serving mankind we are serving God. Inasmuch as ye are serving the least of these my brethren, ye are serving God, ye are serving me. What has happened to our governments? to our churches, to our homes, to our marriages, to our families, to our business, except we have left God out. We have forgotten that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And now 
in order that the lost years of the locust may be restored, in order that we may resurrect our bodies, our homes, our marriages, our business, we must turn now and live, because God has no pleasure in your failure. God has no pleasure in the failure of your business or of your marriage or of your, of your home any more than God has any pleasure in the failure of your body to show forth the glory of God. Your body was meant to show forth the glory of God just as you and I are meant. Why were we created? We were created in the image and likeness of God to show forth God's glory, God's bounty, God's grace. My peace give I unto you. Of course, God has given us his peace. Therefore, to enjoy it, we must know this. God has given me the life I am living, and it is God's life I am living, because God could only give me his life. God has given me his peace so that I may have peace. God has built this temple of my body in which he may dwell, his life dwell. Therefore, my body must be a fitting temple for the Holy Ghost, for the Spirit of God. God has built this entire universe to show forth his glory. God has built business, industry, art, literature, religion, that God's glory may be shown forth. But until we accept, consciously accept God, in the midst of us, it is as if there were no God. As long as we are relying on our human relationships for our good, we are not permitting God to build our lives and to function our lives. Just as we in this room meet together, pray together, meditate together, receive God's grace together, and unite in a most wonderful friendship. So do we understand that this is the limit of the relationship because our real life is lived in the consciousness of God's presence. Our hope, faith, and dependence is not upon each other, but upon the Spirit of God that indwells me, you. God is no respecter of persons. Let it be clear that we are created equal in the sight of God regardless of race, religion, color. We are created equal in the sight of God, but we only maintain that equality by maintaining the country. ...from the sinner. The sinner has removed himself from God, and the way is always open for a return. In that one single moment of turning, though your sins were scarlet, you are now white as snow. Though you have uh, kept God separate and apart from your life or your body or your business or your family, in the moment that you turn as the prodigal turned, even in his deepest extremity, in the moment that he turned, he was on the way back to the father's house, and the father was coming out to meet him. 
in any moment, this moment, of my turning and recognizing God built the temple of my being that I am, God built the temple of my body, of my home, my family, my business, my marriage. In that moment, I am again accepting God as the very cement that holds together the edifice of my life. God is the very cement holding together the entire edifice of every department of my life. But I consciously must bring God into every avenue of my experience so that I make of myself what I originally am, the temple of God. That I make of my household the temple of God. That I make of my marriage the temple of God. That I make of my family the temple of God. That I make of my business the temple of God so that Every day, looking at my business, my art, my profession, I can say, I am glorifying God. I'm seeking to glorify God. I am letting God fill every crevice of this activity of business, art, profession. The whole purpose of it is to show forth God's glory and to bless Mankind, in serving even the least of these with beauty, service, art, wisdom, grace, we are serving God. Every beggar that comes to our door to be fed is a service to God. Every worthwhile product sent forth from our shop dedicated to the service of God is a blessing to man and is under God's grace. In living this infinite way, we have a principle given to us of the Master that acts really to hold together the whole fabric of our demonstration. I have meat the world knows not of. I give you this passage as one of the greatest scriptural passages ever revealed by the Master for a spiritual way of life and one that interprets itself in human terms of success, harmony, and peace. I have meat the world knows not of. Now let us see how we bring this into our lives. Every day we become aware of some need in our experience. And so that we may turn from any fear or doubt, we instantly remember, I have meat. The world knows not of. What is that meat? The Master says, I am the meat. So it means I have the Christ, the spiritual substance of meat, wine, and water, the spiritual substance of life eternal, the spiritual substance of supply. I have it because I have the Christ, the indwelling Son of God. I have meat the world knows not of. I have within me the Spirit of God, which is all the meat, wine, and water I shall ever need, because it will appear externally as that which satisfies every need of the moment, even as the manna 
which was spiritual substance in the consciousness of Moses, outwardly fed his followers. Just as this meat that the world knows not of, this Christ, in the consciousness of Christ Jesus, was the substance of the loaves and fishes that fed the multitudes and still left twelve baskets full over. If uh, you are physically, mentally, morally, or financially ill, accept this gift of God, the meat, the hidden manna, and secretly and sacredly to yourself remember, thank you, Father, I have meat the world knows not of. I have a hidden companionship. I have a hidden source of supply. I have a hidden source of wisdom, of judgment. I have a hidden source of ideas. Regardless of what it is that I may ever need in the external world, I have hidden within me the substance of its form. Home, family, supply, companionship, joy, peace, health, freedom, safety, security. I have the substance of these, the essence of which they are formed in my understanding of this. I have meat the world knows not of. I can relax from fears. I can relax from doubts. I can relax from anxiety by abiding in this word. Thank you, Father. I have meat the world knows not of. As I abide in this, Remember, this is one of the pearls of great price that must not be exposed to the unprepared thought, that must not be thrown before swine to be trampled upon. This is one of the Master's gems and jewels, pearls. This is a secret he imparted to his disciples. I have meat. The world knows not of. I can never hunger and thirst. And he said to you, you will never hunger and thirst. Remember, you will never hunger and thirst because you have this hidden meat, this hidden manna, this hi hidden substance of all form. You will never, if you, if you will accept the meat that I give you, if you will accept the water that I give you, you will never hunger and you will never thirst. And the meat that I give you is this hidden meat, the meat the world knows not of. Accept it and declare to yourself, thank you, Father, I consciously know now that I have the meat, the wine, and the water that the world knows nothing of. I have the hidden manna, the substance of all form. Except my home or my supply or my business is fed by this hidden meat, it cannot endure, except the Lord build not the house, except the Lord feed not the house. It cannot endure. Do you see why it isn't outside union of peoples, of governments, of contracts in which we find strength? There has never been a law enacted that couldn't be legally broken, 
There has never been a contract that couldn't be broken. There has never been an agreement between nations that hasn't been broken. There has never been a human relationship, even that of parent and child, that hasn't been broken. But when the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain to try to destroy it. What God has brought together, no man can put asunder. The meat that I give you, the wine and the water that I give you, no man can take from you because, you see, it's invisible. It is within you. It is truth. No one can take truth from you, and truth is that which I am. Therefore, truth is the bread, the meat, the wine, and the water. And as long as you have this truth, as long as you accept this meat that I offer you, and wine and water, you will never hunger, you will never thirst, you will never lack, you will never fail. There is no such thing as failure in the kingdom of God. There is no such thing as failure in a life that is built on my word. The army, the armies of the aliens outnumbered the army of the Hebrews but their master said, fear not, they have only the arm of flesh. We have this hidden meat. This is our strength, not weapons. Our strength is in the hidden meat, the wine and the water. And this they can't reach. Their eyes cannot penetrate to the invisible. Therefore, our weapons can never be touched, destroyed, harmed. Nor the temple, which I am. And they rested in his word. They rested in this word. They rested in the assurance they have only the arm of flesh, but we have spiritual manna, spiritual strength, spiritual numbers, infinity. And then the enemy fought among themselves and destroyed each other. So that the Hebrews did not even have to fight. So do you find, regardless of who you may believe your enemies to be or what they may be, do not depend on visible strength. Do not depend on your muscles or your arms And even though your nation builds storehouses of arms, let your reliance be not on those arms, but on the meat that I give you, on the strength that I give you, on the inspiration that I give you. I can give you meat, wine, and water. And if you will accept these, you will never hunger or thirst. You will never want. You will never know unhappiness or failure. But you must accept the meat, wine, and water that I give you, not that the world gives you. And I give you hidden manna. I give you the word of God which is, I have meat. Now you are accepting this word that I'm giving you, 
And if you accept it, you can then say, Thank you, Father. You have offered me yourself. You have offered me the hidden manna of yourself, of your kingdom within me. You have offered me infinite, eternal meat, wine, and water. And I accept. And from this moment on, I will live secretly, silently, sacredly, in the assurance that you have given and I have accepted that meat which is Christ, that meat which is spirit, that meat which is the spiritual substance of all form. And I accept that as an invisible substance that man whose breath is in his nostrils cannot see, cannot fight, cannot reach. It is therefore said in the Bhagavad Gita that this life of mine cannot be burned with fire, it cannot be drowned with water, it cannot be destroyed with a knife. Why? This life of mine is invisible, incorporeal. The temple which I am is invisible, incorporeal. It cannot be drowned with water. It cannot be burned with fire. It cannot be destroyed by bullets. Nor can my substance be taken from me, my supply, my home, my family. For this is the meat the Father has given me. This is the divine union of I and my Father. And in this union, all that the Father hath is mine. In this union, the Father says, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. What does the Father have? Meat, wine, and water. Life. Life everlasting life eternal. I am come, this meat the Master gave us, I am come that ye might have life, that ye might have it more abundantly. What sustains this life? The meat that I have given you. If you accept the meat, the wine and the water, you will never hunger again. You will never thirst again. But remember, your values now are changed. You are not counting the dollars in your bank. You're not counting the investments in your vault or your properties. You're not measuring by how many bombs the government lays up. You have made a transition in this moment to the spiritual life in which I am the temple of God. I am invisible, I am spiritual, I am incorporeal. I am the temple of God in which God dwells. And I have within me that meat, that wine, that water, which is spiritual and which is the substance of my external safety, security, abundance, eternality. I have within me the substance of all form, the hidden manna. I am the temple of God, and I have within me hidden manna. That hidden manna is the spiritual substance, the meat, the wine, and the water, of everything necessary to the harmonious, joyous, abundant life.
I am the temple of God. God is in his holy temple. And I have within this temple that I am my hidden manna. Now you know why our relationship with each other and our relationship with every infinite way student around the world is of a sacred nature because we are united together only by the spiritual bond of understanding by the understanding of our relationship to God and thereby our relationship to each other, we are united in the spiritual understanding of the nature of the temple of God and of the hidden manna. Thank you. Thank you.